After we learn how to blend alcohol markers, the next thing everyone wants to know is how to shade objects for depth, dimension, and ultimately realism. But because the marker community emphasizes color blending more than any other technique, well, every colorer is convinced that the secret to realistic looking flowers is simply to find the right color combination. Throughout this series of color theory videos, I've introduced you to a new way of thinking about colors like yellow, green, pink, blue, and violet. We've used the color wheel to simplify the process of selecting shade colors. Instead of hunting through our marker collections to find the right color and crossing our fingers that we've picked the best one, we're letting the color wheel determine which shade colors work best. So we've mixed yellow and violet. We've mixed green and pink, and we've used color theory to make lots of delicious muddy colors. But now we get to the color red, and here's where we finally have to acknowledge the biggest red hurdle you face as an artist, whether you're using markers or colored pencils or any kind of paint. We can study color theory for years. We can read all the books and do all the exercises, but until you admit that you're a little bit colorblind, color theory can't help you. We have a red problem, and I don't know why this issue happens more with red than any other color, and I don't know why it almost always happens with roses in particular, but once I explain what I mean, you're going to start noticing this everywhere. Red is a bold color. It demands attention. Red is a strong color, but that doesn't mean it's a dark color. The problem with coloring a red rose is that we automatically assume that red is darker than it actually is. So you might look at this photo reference and because you've been taught that shading is super important, your eye is going to go right to the little recesses and crevices. You're going to say, oh my, look at all that deep dark color in there. And you'll grab a bunch of really dark markers and you'll color your little fingers off, adding tons of blackened color to a bright red rose. But hang on a minute, the shade here isn't black. It's not even close. If we switch our rose reference to grayscale, we can start to see red more accurately. The reds in this rose aren't as dark as you thought, right? And the recesses, the shadiest areas of this rose are only about as dark as the lighter green of the background. Our eyes, or maybe it's our brain, and this is true for everyone, we're all biased about the color red we naturally assume that red is darker than it actually is. And so we go overboard shading red with darker markers than we really need. So in the last episode, as we selected red markers for our Rosebud project, and as we tested different complements of red to create desaturated shady colors, we had to be very mindful and fight the natural tendency to pick a darker red than we need and then to make the shade darker than necessary. And in today's demo, I have to be careful not to overshade the rose myself. Because burnt roses are for amateurs. We want more from our coloring. Today's Red Rosebud project uses the following markers. I'll start with a background of BG11, and my reds are R46, R35, and R14. I'll underpaint the reds with BG34 or BG32 and the green stem and sepals will be colored with G94 and G24. So let's start with the background this time, because BG11 is a very light marker. So if we accidentally color parts of the rose with the aqua marker, the reds and greens can easily fix that mistake. Plus, I don't want to mess up the darker reds and greens. BG11 has a lot of solvent in the formula, so if I add the background after the rose is completed, if that BG11 touches red or green, it can do some real damage. So what I'm doing here is called a scumbling stroke. I build a little fence around the image and then I go up onto the point of my marker and make almost a scribble type of stroke. 
Pretend that you're a doctor and you have very, very messy handwriting. Get up onto the point of the marker and then you're squiggling a little bit clockwise and then go counterclockwise and make those strokes really random. Now the two tricks to doing a nice scumbling is to make sure that you're up on the point don't be on the side of the marker. And then the next thing is to make sure that you're not continually going clockwise or always going counterclockwise. You need to reverse direction, keep it nice and light and delicate, and as you get closer to the margins, do less and less. It's a very organic, natural looking background, but it's also kind of cute. Don't forget to do down at the bottom. We've got this little peekaboo spot and then directly on the other side of the stem, we have another little hidden background spot. Now let's move to the stem and the sepals. This is BG34 and then G94 goes over the top of it. The two markers combine to form a darker green. And then I flick slightly out beyond it and then add G24 over the top. And this gives me a three marker blending combination for that stem. But the sepals are lighter, so I'm gonna eliminate that BG34 and only use the G94 and the G24 for the rest of these parts. So the G94 goes down over the darkest areas, and then this G24 goes over the top of the G94, smoothing it out. You'll see me using these very short little flick strokes. And I do the flick stroke in order to control the amount of ink that I'm placing down on the paper. With a flick stroke, you always know exactly where the most ink is hitting the paper and where the least ink is touching the paper. And so I'm always making sure that my dark areas have more ink than my lighter areas. Just putting those darks down first and then I'll come down with the G24 and smooth them all out and complete each supple. You'll also notice my strokes start at the base of the supple and end at the point. If you were to lay your marker down and start at the point, it would create a little ball of ink and the points wouldn't look pointy. Cleaning up my, my lines there, just making sure that the edge of the red is going to be nice and crisp. Now let's move to the reds. This is BG34 and it's going in that teeny tiny little crevice there where we're seeing deep into the rose. And now this is BG32, which is a step lighter. And this is gonna keep our reds from getting too overly dark. I stepped up the green a little bit lighter so that the red that goes over the top of it won't look as dark. So here is my darkest red, the R46, and it's going over the top of that BG34 and over the top of the BG32, and it's forming just like a series of dark reds. I'm flicking over the top of that green and then my flicks are coming out just a little bit farther, so I'm getting a lot of areas that are just clean red with no green underneath. Now the R35 goes over the top of the R46 and over the top of the two blue greens. And then I'm going to finish it off with a coat of the R14. Now let's move to the next area. So where I've got that blue green, I'm going over the top of it with the R46. And I'm always flicking in the directions that the veins on the petal would run. That way, if my flick strokes don't melt out, they kind of look like veins. Up there in the little dark crevice, and then flicking outward towards the edge of the petal, there's a ripple right there, so I'm building in the darkness underneath the fold. R35 will go over the top of the 46 and then flick out slightly beyond. The 35 starts the blending process by softening that 46, but remember, the 46 is a stubborn marker, so it's going to take a lot of juice from the 35 and now that 14 to blend it out. It's not you physically rubbing the paper that blends an alcohol marker. The alcohol ink wants to blend all on its own. Your job is to give the paper enough ink and then get out of its way and let it blend on its own. So you'll see me inking the area heavily with this R14 
adding enough solvent to the paper to allow the inks to blend. Now here's an area where a lot of flower colors go wrong because they assume that every single petal on the whole entire image needs the same blending combination. This little flap right here is folding out outwards towards the viewer, but it's also catching the light. So I'm only using the R35 and the R14 on this area. It's going to be lighter and brighter. It's going to feel closer to us because I'm not using any underpaint. There's no BG there. And I'm also not using that dark R46. Lots of ink so it will blend, but you'll notice that this area looks the lightest and the brightest when we're done. Now let's go dark again in this little crevice. More BG32 and then R46 over the top of the blue green, hiding it completely. Nobody's gonna know it's down there. It's our little secret, but it's the secret to the right color and the right depth of shade. Here's the 35 going over the top of the 46. My flicks will come out slightly beyond the area of 46. And so that way I've got an area that's shady. I've got an area that's dark 46. And now I'm creating an area that's all 35 by itself. I'm gonna come up here where there's a little fold and this is just a little extra R35 up there at the top. It's a gentle bit of darkness, not heavy, not super shady, just a little bit. And then the R14 here, you're gonna see me being really thorough. I'm pressing into the paper and that releases an extra amount of ink. I'm really inking the paper well here to allow those red ink molecules to separate from the paper fibers, to come free and to start to swim and blend on their own. Back with that BG32, there's an area of darkness right here. The R46 goes over the top of it as this petal kind of bends and tilts towards the sun. Always using that flick stroke. I know that where I set the marker down, there's always a release of ink right there. So the flick stroke helps me plan where to put that release so that it's not way out in an area that I want to look light later. 35 over the top of the 46 and now here's that 14 the lightest and the brightest of our markers and it's finishing off that petal just giving it a nice little out turn there's lots of little wrinkles in here this is that center of the rose so there's going to be some darkness but only in the deepest crevices most of my shading here is actually going to happen with the R46 marker. So that 46 goes over the top of the BG, but there's a lot more 46 than there is BG. And then the 35 starts that blending process. The R14 packs in the solvent and allows everything to smooth itself out. Extra coat, just to be sure. I'm working on Bristol here, Bristol board, and it's a very nice paper for markers, but reds can be kind of stubborn. So I'm giving this image a little bit of extra ink, more than I normally would if I was working on something like Express It. BG in the corner, and then that red combination over the top of the BG. First the 46, now the 35. The 35 forms that local mid-tone color. And then here's that R14 over the top, adding lots of solvent. Give it a good amount of juice and these inks will blend on their own. Now here I've got three small little areas. So I'm going to pre-underpaint with the BG. Now I'm capping that marker and I'm just gonna set it aside. But still, when I come back to do the reds, because red is stubborn, I'm gonna do these one at a time. So the BG rehydrates easily, the red will not. And I'm not gonna go through and do all of the red 46. I'm going to go through the entire red blending combination for each petal individually.
Here we go, 46 over the next area of BG. These areas are really small. This is a coloring exercise. It's supposed to take about 30 minutes. Normally I would be coloring an, a rosebud that's probably twice this size. It's a little constrained for me. And I've found that I think it's easier. The larger the image, the more realism you can get out of it. There's just more room to add more detail and more accurate placement of the color. When it's small like this, it's almost a challenge just to fit your markers into that area. And there we go, the completed Copic. Now let's add colored pencil details. I'm using six pencils. They're all Prismacolor except for one, the first one, which is Derwent Lightfast Purple. They don't have numbers on them, so it's just called Purple. If you have Prismacolor number 931, you can use that, but I find that over time, it sometimes can turn like a hot pink color if it comes in contact with white or cream. So I've found that the Derwent Lightfast just is a safer pencil to use. So that's Derwent Lightfast Purple. My remaining Prismacolor pencils are Kelp Green 1090, Cream 914, Crimson Lake 925, Canary Yellow 916 and Aquamarine 905. So I'm starting with that Derwent Lightfast Purple, and I know it seems weird to put purple over the top of green, but purple is kind of an oppositional, it's not a direct complement of green, but it is an indirect complement. And I'll be using it elsewhere so it makes sense to deepen my dark green areas with this purple pencil as well. Here comes that kelp green. Sometimes the purple feels a little bit too strong, so I back off and use the kelp green just to start sculpting this supple where it comes out from underneath the red rose petal and then also where it gets down to the end. And I'll be adding a little crease down the center of each one of these sepals and turning up the edges a bit. Each sepal is gonna have a bit of purple, a bit of kelp green, and then I'll also add a tiny bit of cream along the edge. So here comes that cream and it's just gonna pull the edge forward, pop it out and make it just stand forward a little bit. And a little highlight on the stem as well. Back to that kelp green, right where the supple comes out from underneath the red petal, there's gonna be some darkness there. And then the supple is turning down at the point, so I'm gonna darken it down there a bit. Now I'm gonna enhance that darkness just a step further with purple. The purple doesn't completely cover the green, it's just like the darker dark next to the green. And even though it looks like I'm spending a bit of time stroking that area several times, I'm pressing hardly at all. So there's almost no color going down onto the paper. It's just enough to enhance the Copic, not so much that I'm hiding the Copic. There's no point in coloring this completely with expensive markers and then hiding it with the pencils later. I always want that marker to shine through. There's a fold in this supple, so I darkened the inside of the fold and the bottom portion with the dark purple. And now I'm gonna enhance the edge of that supple with just a little bit of the cream. I take these supples one by one, and I'm always looking at where is this positioned? I don't always use the same amount of purple or the same amount of green or the same amount of cream. Every supple is different. Some of them are a little shadier. Some of them are a little brighter. I don't use the same recipe on everything. Now let's turn to the red petals. So this little crevice here is the darkest area on the whole entire rose. So I put a little purple in there, but then did you see how I pulled back on the pencil and I started holding it from farther away? When you see me do that, I'm lightening my pressure even more. Just like I used a bit of kelp green on the sepals, now I'm using that crimson lake in the same position on the red petals. So the purple does the super pushing and then the red does just a little gentle push. I want these petals to look like they're waving 
and not really bent, but just kind of like wrinkled at the edges. So you'll see me coming in from the outer edge with a little bit of this crimson. And then in a bit, I'll use a little bit of cream too. And it's gonna give that kind of wavy edge to it. Pushing the petal back behind that main fold forward with the purple and then softening it out again with the crimson red. And again, I'm pressing, well, hardly at all. I want the Copic to shine through. The Copic is the superstar, not the pencils. I'm just darkening this underside right here. It's kind of curved here. And so I wanna make sure that it doesn't look flat, that it looks like it's bending around the roundness, the cylinder shape of the rosebud itself. And I'm pushing this right here because as I'm adding this dark purple and some of the crimson, that's gonna pull the bend forward even more. So this little lip right here is gonna look closer to us because I did that pushing first. Now let's work on the lip of this petal. So we colored the base of it and this is the part that's rising up and curling towards us. So where the lip sits closest to the base of the rosebud, it gets a little bit of that crimson red. And now I'm coming along trying to give that edge the ruffles or the undulation that happens. We don't want petals that looks, look like they've been pressed flat with an iron. They have a wave to them. And I'm trying to create that wave by coming in from the edges with the Crimson Lake. It should be a subtle ripple. You don't wanna add pleats to the edge of the rose petal. It has to have some motion to it, otherwise it won't look lifelike. Now, we did that lip, so now we're turning to the petal that sits immediately behind it. So I built in a little bit of darkness with the crimson, but it wasn't quite enough, so now I'm strengthening it with the dark purple. But again, I'm not pressing hard at all. Darkening right under that little bit of the upturn at the end of this petal, very softly with the crimson red, and then I'm pushing all those ruffles behind it. Any place that I need a little bit of extra strength, and that's usually where there's been some VG, I'll add the dark purple. But you want to go really sparingly with that dark purple because it's a strong color. So go very softly, use almost no pressure, and use less than you think you need to. You can always come back and add more. So you'll see me spending most of the time, most of the time with my markers, but also most of the time with my colored pencil. I do more pushing than I do highlighting. That's generally the ratio that I do. It's about two thirds pushing and one third highlighting. I think people tend to over highlight things because those are fun, but the push is actually what creates the dimension, not the highlight. back and forth, back and forth between the red and the purple. And I really only use the purple when the red doesn't feel like it's enough. So anytime that I'm tempted to add like a fourth coat of red or press even harder with the red, that's when I pull out the purple because it's just got a little bit more of a voice. It speaks louder and that color can do the job more efficiently than the red can. But again, I'm always trying to make sure that I don't overuse the purple. And I never want to use so much purple that it actually looks purple. It should always look like dark red. Every time I do a petal, I start at the base and kind of push that base deeper. And then I'll come in and do the wrinkles on the edge. Now look at how far away from the point of the pencil I'm holding this yellow. I want to add a kiss of sunshine. I want the red to be a warmer temperature over on, well, let's say the west side of each petal. So where a petal turns over and faces west, I'm adding just a little bit of this sunshine color. Now canary yellow, I'm very specific about this yellow because it's a transparent yellow. All of the other Prismacolor yellows contain white, which means they're gonna hide the red that's below. Because canary is a transparent color, it allows the red to shine through, and you would never really know that I even used a yellow pencil in this area. It almost looks like I used a warm red Copic. Now here's that cream. 
All of this time I've been pushing areas and adding sunshine. For the very first time I'm highlighting the edges of some of these petals. Be careful. Highlighting is fun and so we tend to do just too much of it. And notice I'm not using a white colored pencil because the highlights on a red rose are not white. So just like with that sunshine color, I'm kind of thinking about the westward edges. So if an area looks like it's pointed due west, or if it's just sitting out in front of other areas, that's where those, those are the areas that get that coat of cream. Not a lot. I will say that cream is a pencil that doesn't really want to stick to the paper as much. So you do have to press a little bit harder with the cream but I'm still not pressing hard as like your average um, crafter would use on a card or something. Very, very, very light pressure. You can always come back and add more colored pencil, but if you press too hard, you start to burnish the paper, you're damaging the paper fibers, and you're making it really hard to erase that color. Just a little kiss here and there to let those ripples kind of show through. And then every once in a while, as I'm going over an area with the cream, I notice that, well, you know, that area needs to be pushed deeper. So that's why you see me stop and pick up the red or maybe even the purple sometimes. It's just because as I'm looking at the petal, I realize that I didn't push quite enough the first time. Some petals receive a lot of cream. Some petals receive no cream. You have to change up the recipe based on how light or dark that petal is. Now right here, I'm doing a little bit of veining. I'm using a very, very light stroke with the crimson red. And now here, you can see, you can barely tell what I did with the crimson, but here I'm gonna put just a little highlight on the west side of each one of those veins. Very, very light. You don't want this to look too dark or it'll be kind of grotesque. And then here, I'm just gonna add a little bit of red shade on the east side of all of these veins. It's a subtle thing. Don't do it too dark or it'll look like bloodshot eyes. We really don't want that. I had an empty space there, so I added a little bit of an extra vein. A little bit of dark purple right there to push it a little bit deeper. Now let's come back and make these sepals feel like they belong to a red rose. So in those areas where I need just a little extra pushing and then on the points of each sepal, I'm using red. Red over green creates kind of a black color, but then as it emerges on the end of each one of those sepals, you can also just see the little red fringe hanging off the end of each one. Let's work on the background, and this is a cast shadow. Now I try not to stress about my cast shadow. You'll notice that I'm using a lamb's woolling stroke, which is round and round and round. I never draw the shape of a shadow, because as soon as you draw something, you're establishing an outline for it, and if it has an outline, it doesn't look like a shadow. So right there, I figure the sepal is touching the paper, so the shadow is going to be really close. And then as it goes back towards the body of the rose, it gets farther away. You can look at my finished sample to see how I'm doing these shapes. Years and years of doing cast shadows allows me to do them with confidence. But even then, I'm not stressing over them because honestly, if you make a mistake, 95% of the time, nobody's going to notice. I'm doing it very lightly with an aquamarine colored pencil and I can erase it if it looks wrong, but it also kind of blends in with the background here. I'll strengthen it once I'm more confident about the shape. So a green object is going to cast a little bit of a green shadow. So I'm using a green pencil over the top of the aquamarine and right where the green sepals touch the paper, I'm gonna put just a little bit more green than usual but I am putting a little bit of green everywhere. And now here comes the red. 
red over green over aquamarine over BG11. That's a little color theory at work there. These three colors are kind of fighting each other. And anytime you have a color fight, the brain interprets that as a shady, shadowy, muddy color. Perfect for a cast shadow. I could use a gray pencil, but why? I don't have any gray anywhere else, so my shadow wouldn't be gray. And there you go, a completed red rose color study. I love the color red. It's my favorite color, and I love to add hints and kisses of red to almost all my projects. But I know, for beginners and even for experienced colors, red is a challenge to color and to shade. It takes practice to see red objects with an artistic, accurate eye, and to see that red isn't as dark as you once thought. It also takes practice not to overshade your reds. By giving red layers of aqua and then adding purple over the top, we started to develop the murky, nameless color that mimics what happens to red rose petals in the shade. At first, it feels weird. It feels weird to deliberately make muddy colors, to take nice, beautiful reds and mess them up with a blue-green marker and a purple pencil. But what I've realized over the years is that I'm not interested in the flowers where the artist has used nothing but clean and pretty colors. They're too saturated. There's no breathing room. There's no shade. Cloudy, rainy days help you appreciate the sunny days. Shade does the same thing. Murky color in the shade. It helps you appreciate all the clean, clear colors in the sunny spots of a flower. There's a balance to realistic coloring. We need the shade to appreciate the sun, but not too much shade. Too much is just as bad as not enough. Practice your red rosebud and work on shading red with a light and delicate touch. And if you enjoyed coloring roses with me today, you'll love my yellow lesson. We're using color theory to color a realistic daffodil here.